Yeah, but mic test. Yeah, so you have to share screen basically, not 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 window. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah. I have to share in that desktop. Uh, yeah, uh, desktop two. Yeah, there we go. And then try. Let's try it again. Okay. Okay. Cool. And let me just go outside. Okay. Yeah. So let me plug. Do you need some water? Yeah, I'm going to place the water under. <laughs> I uh like at some point I was running like a Thank you. 
appreciate uh, <laughs> the attention to pronunciation. Sure, go ahead. Hi everyone, thanks for coming to the EI seminar today. I'm really uh, happy to welcome Marco Pavone, uh, who is currently an associate professor in Aero Astro at Stanford, where he directs the Autonomous Systems Laboratory and the Center of Automated Research. He is also the director of Autonomous Vehicle Research at NVIDIA. And before that, he did his PhD in Aero Astro here in 2010. Uh, and he's uh, gotten numerous different awards, such as the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists as Engineers and, and the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, among many others. Again, really excited to welcome Marco to our uh, seminar today. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. It's always uh, nice to be back here. As I was mentioning before, I still feel that uh, MIT is a little bit of my home. So it's always a pleasure to be back here. So today what I'm going to do is to provide you with an overview of my recent research on building trust in AI for autonomous vehicles. So now AI in particular machine learning is of course ubiquitous in modern autonomy stats. AI models, for example, have been dominating uh, perception since roughly, I would say 2014. Similarly, AI models are ubiquitous in uh, uh, most of the prediction algorithms out there. And while AI models are not as predominant yet for, for decision-making and planning tasks, they're certainly getting some traction. For example, uh, by providing superior performance for the task of uh, computing uh, high-level uh, decisions. And this is, of course, for good reasons. AI models and uh, AI-based reasoning techniques provide uh, a unique way, way to cope with uh, all the difficult situations that an autonomous vehicle can face during day-to-day uh, -day operations. But AI models, of course, are not perfect. For example, AI models may not have uh, enough uh, semantic understanding of a scene to adequately reason about a vehicle on a trailer, as you can see in this image, or a low flying bird, as you can see in the bottom image on the left. Or they may not be able to handle the ambiguity that uh, we might have in some scenes. For example, the one on the top right, where it is difficult to disambiguate whether the human is a cyclist or maybe a pedestrian. Or more simply, they might get confused by auto-domain objects. That is objects that were never seen in the training data distribution. By the way, all of these are real cases. And for example, the aircraft on the bottom right caused quite a few troubles to a Tesla vehicle that was constantly braking because of course was confused by an aircraft in the middle of the road. So one way to uh, uh, design safe uh, AI-based systems is to complement 
AI-based systems with uh, classical rule-based uh, uh, algorithmic uh, pipelines without the common causes of uh, failure. So basically you have the AI-based model in parallel with the more traditional classical hand queue model. The two outputs are refused, typically with a rule-based logic, and then the output is used by downstream control uh, models. Now, one disadvantage of this architecture is that uh, on the one hand requires additional computation. You have this kind of legacy code that you need to use in order to augment your AI-based pipeline. But most importantly, it limits in a way the gains that could be achieved by the AI model, because basically you are still anchoring its efficiency by the efficiency of the legacy code. So the question is, how can we complement such an architectural approach to safety that, by the way, is basically the standard in the industry by leveraging advancement in algorithm design. So basically by accounting for safety assurances as part of the design and operation of AI models. So specifically the end goal is to fully harness the capability offered by AI models while easing as much as possible the need for extra architectural components. So to this purpose, so, you know, my research on algorithmic AI safety targets advancements in how we design the model, how we deploy them, and how we maintain such models throughout their life cycle. Specifically, we work on design time uh, assurances, whereby we develop techniques to robustly train machine learning models, along with techniques to provide uh, calibrated uncertainty estimates for those components that are data-driven. Second, complementary to design time assurances, we work on uh, deployment time assurances, whereby we design runtime monitors that monitor the behavior of AI models during operations. For example, to trigger contingency plans in case we detect erratic behavior. And finally, at the product lifecycle level, we work on techniques to rigorously validate model performance, uh, along with tools to store and label data that can be used for model retraining. And I think that such a multi-pronged approach to safety is needed in order to achieve the level of trust needed for safety critical autonomy. So basically there is no silver bullet here. So in this talk, I'm going to discuss my work on three main areas, namely simulation for the evaluation and development of AV stacks, uncertainty quantification, and the runtime monitoring. Starting with the topic of simulation, particularly in the context of autonomous driving. So simulation is in many ways the holy grail for the development of autonomous stacks. Here I'm showing an example from the simulator that NVIDIA is developing for autonomous driving applications called DriveSim. However, we are still not ready to use these simulators to fully validate the end-to-end -end performance of a driving stack. And uh, one of the key missing pieces uh, that prevents us from using these simulators is that uh, the behaviors of the simulated human agents are typically rather simple and controlled by game-like type of logic. But of course, the real world driving behaviors are much more complex and nuanced. So the question is, how can we build intelligent agents to generate uh, realistic human-like driving behaviors? Now, in the past few years, there has been a lot of progress in modeling human behaviors for the purposes of trajectory forecasting. So basically to forecast what uh, other agents on the road will be doing in the next uh, few seconds. And in particular, my lab at Stanford has been developing a fairly general generative model to forecast uh, human trajectories, whereby the idea is to learn a distribution P of a future human actions denoted by U sub H T plus one, conditional on the uh, interaction history denoted by XU and highlighted in gray, as well as conditional on a candidate robot action sequence uh, highlighted in purple. The interaction history, for example, can represent the history of relative poses between the ego vehicle and the other vehicles on the road. Now, conditioning on history lets you infer things about driver behavior, such as aggressiveness or alertness. And conditioning on the future candidate robot action sequence allows you to capture the interactive aspect of an interaction. So basically the way you want to use these models is if, for example, the vehicle were to do a lane change, what would be the possible responses from all the other humans on the road? And then based on that, you decide which action to enact. 
our framework called Trajectron Plus Plus is based on the conditional variation autoencoder model that can ingest as a conditioning variables a vast set of heterogeneous data. From dynamical information, obviously the dynamics of a pedestrian are different from those of a cyclist, all the way to map information, for example, encoding the crosswalks information or road boundary information, all the way to human silhouettes in order to forecast the trajectories of uh, pedestrians. We've thoroughly tested Trajectron Plus Plus in closed loop with the planning algorithms on the test vehicle that we have at the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. The role of the human-driven vehicle is taken by a small RC car, which is controlled remotely by a student. And the reason why we use an RC car in these experiments is that we want to stress test our algorithms in a very dynamic situations, like for example, traffic weaving here. And so we want to make sure that nobody obviously gets injured in case of a failure. Now, elements of our research have been incorporated in the prediction network that is currently used within the NVIDIA AV product and the net network is called prediction net, here forecasting agent futures in a highway merge maneuver. Now, of course, the task of predicting what humans will do in the future is quite clo close to the task of emulating how uh, a human could uh, behave. So the question becomes, how can we extend this body of literature on uh, generative prediction models to build a realistic traffic uh, models. So concretely, we have four key desiderata for uh, simulation traffic models. First, fidelity. Can we synthesize agent group behaviors that resemble real world traffic? Second, diversity. That is, can we generate a wide range of realistic traffic scenarios? Third, controllability. Can we steer the traffic model towards scenarios that we are really interested in, for example, for uh, evaluation. And finally, adapti adaptivity. That is, can we uh, adapt to new regions of the world with a little to no tuning? So if I train a simulated behavioral model, a behavioral model for simulation in the United States, can I transfer it to Italy with just a handful of uh, additional data? But we face a number of technical research challenges, in particular stability, we want to provide, uh, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the simulation uh, does not diverge out of reasonable behaviors. And of course, what is reasonable or not is uh, something tricky to define and we'll come back to this later. A second long horizon simulation. We want to be able to simulate uh, humans for minutes, if not hours, that is with a horizon that is much longer than the training data horizon. So as I said, we have a good idea of how to model driving behaviors for the purposes of trajectory forecasting. But can we just use a prediction model to simulate the interactive agents? And the answer is not quite. For example, the left video is a sample driving trajectory from a real world driving log. As shown in the right video, if we just follow the most likely trajectory produced by trajectory forecasting model, I just drive a chunk of it and then I close the loop, then immediately the agent diverges from a normal driving behavior and stops in the middle of the road. And the fundamental reason for this divergence lies in the prediction model errors that accumulate over time and eventually cause the machine learning model to diverge from situations that it knows how to handle. And then the output becomes completely erratic. Basically the model gets into an auto distribution situation pretty quickly and then freaks out and the outputs uh, are no longer sensible. So to address this limitation, we have developed a hierarchical decision-making framework that disentangles the imitation problems of uh, modeling high-level intent and uh, low-level control. So the idea is basically quite simple. We are emulating how we as humans drive. First, we set uh, high-level goals in terms of where we want to go. And then we make low level control decisions in order to get there. So show in, shown in the left video, the high level planner learns to set the goals by sampling from a spatial probability map, which is shown on the right. And then a goal conditional policy makes a low level con control decisions in order to reach uh, the selected uh, target. And the policy uses a kin vehicle kinematic model in order to ensure physical plausibility of the motion. 
There are a lot of details here, but the key insight is that such a decoupling approach is key in order to achieve a stable uh, simulation as it significantly simplifies the learning problem and thereby enables better generalization. So with this framework, we can create a very diverse scenarios by controlling all agents in the scene. And in, the vision is that in this way, we can uh, generate countless realistic traffic patterns that can allow an autonomous vehicle to accumulate an unprecedented amount of experience in terms of realistic uh, interactions with the human agents. And we can also envision alternate evolutions of the scene in order to enable uh, counterfactual uh, reasoning. Now, a natural question is, uh, going back to a point that I made earlier, is uh, to what extent uh, uh, the behaviors that we generate are plausible and uh, realistic? And this is a very difficult question. Designing evaluation metrics for traffic simulation is uh, very, very hard. There is no single metric that really measures the realism of a simulated trajectory. And we cannot easily compare with ground truth data sets since we want to generate new and diverse scenarios. So to address this problem, we have been developing a variety of metrics that basically follow into three categories. The first are rollout metrics, which basically measure low level trajectory uh, quantities like, for example, how much area is covered by repeated uh, rollout, basically simulation traces, how varied the different rollouts are with respect to each other, and uh, whether uh, we you know, encounter collisions or off-roading events. Second, we have a statistical comparisons, whereby we compare simulated distributions of dynamic quantities, like uh, speed and jerk for the trajectories, and we compare these uh, quantities with real world driving logs. And finally, we have learned human likeness uh, scores, whereby we measure the likelihood of a simulated trajectory with respect to uh, a trajectory forecasting model that is trained on real world driving logs. So, view all together, all these metrics paint. Uh, provide an, uh, a good idea of the weaknesses and strengths of the different methods. Our methodology called uh, BITS, and uh, whose bar is in green, actually outperforms uh, uh, pretty much all of the methods out there. And BITS, again, uh, uh, relies on this hierarchical decomposition of the mutation problem into high-level goal uh, generation and then low-level control generation. So, so far, I showed you models that allow us uh, to produce uh, uh, high fidelity, uh, diverse simulations for different agents on the road. But as I mentioned earlier, another important desideratum is the ability to make these simulations highly controllable so that we can steer the simulation towards scenarios that we are really interested in, like for example, cutting type of uh, interactions. But this is difficult because of course the models that are presented are uh, machine learning models, neural networks. And so the opaque nature of these models make, make it difficult to steer their output toward desired scenarios. So to this purpose, we have developed a technology that uh, leverages differentiable logic to guide generated trajectories to meet rules defined using a particular type of logic referred to as a signal temporal logic. And in particular, we harness the power of diffusion models and guide their denoising process with the gradients of user-specified STL formulas uh, in order to produce outputs that satisfy some uh, desired rules. Let me give an example. So say we wish for some vehicles to stop, to stop for whatever reason in certain regions. So the top video shows the simulation from bits with no guidance, where the three vehicles on the bottom lane go through the intersection and then on onto the subsequent road. In the bottom video, we, uh, we added rules that enforce those specific cars to stop in the uh, squares that you see below. And, and you can see how basically with this guidance, the cars perfectly stop in those uh, square boxes. So this methodology provides a convenient way to guide data-driven traffic models to emulate scenarios with specific characteristics. Whereby, for example, a driver, for example, we want to generate a scenario where some of the drivers are inattentive and do not stop at the stop sign. Because those are really the ones that stress test uh, an autonomy step. 
So what we're going with this is to devise a, a text to simulation of the sort where we want to use a power, powerful large language models to encode natural language specifications of scenarios of interest. Like for example, uh, statements describing the uh, police statements describing uh, the condition of a real world uh, collision. And I like to say that this is in a way a generative AI on steroid because we are not doing text to image, we're not doing, we are not doing text to scenario, we're not doing text to video, we're really doing text to simulation. So basically we are generating the policies. And the idea here is that uh, these natural language specifications can be translated into STL rules that provide really the grounding for your language model and then enforced by them, thereby ending simulations of real world, for example, uh, collision scenarios. As an example, uh, our latest model is uh, able to factor in uh, specific instruction, for example, from this prompt, generated traffic scenario where vehicle A crashes into the left side of vehicle B at uh, an intersection, and it can do so quite accurately. So again, everything is data driven, but we have added the guidance and the noise process to force the scenario to converge to this crash that has happened. So actually we are mining the police reports from the United States to uh, basically systematically generate uh, all possible collisions that have happened in the past. So summing up the key takeaway uh, uh, here is that the generative AI is the key enabling tool for us to achieve a high fidelity, diverse and controllable simulation. We're currently investigating a number of directions related to this topic. First, uh, as already mentioned, combining large language models and behavioral models to enhance diversity and uh, controllability. Second, devising techniques to efficiently adapt behavioral models with uh, uh, additional offline or online uh, data. For example, we have be using meta learning ideas for this purpose in the paper that uh, will appear at the next uh, ICRA conference. We're working on devising uh, high fidelity models of pedestrians and more broadly of, either, uh, of other agent types, like for example, cyclists. We're working on ways to best integrate such a simulation capability in a safety evaluation workflows. And then we're also working on setting up and releasing data sets and tools in order to catalyze research on this topic. And recently we have released a package called the TBSIM, which supports closed loop simulation with uh, data-driven traffic models. So this package uh, implements a variety of uh, uh, learned uh, behavioral models that are available in the literature, including ours, it provides uh, uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure, for example, for simulation, for training, for logging, for visualization. It provides uh, metrics. Some of them uh, were discussed before. So if you're interested in uh, traffic modeling and closed loop simulation, you may want to check out uh, this package. All right, so hopefully we'll soon be able to test end-to-end uh, -end autonomous text and simulation by properly accounting for human-robot interactions. But how do we build robust AI-based models in the first place for safety critical robot autonomy? Now, there is currently a lot of work, including in my group, on robust training strategies. But even when models are trained robustly, they typically still not achieve 100% accuracy. So it is desirable that the AI models can communicate uncertainty in their predictions in a way that is uh, uh, calibrated Trustworthy can be used confidently in a downstream uh, you know, control and planning models, which leads us to the topic of uncertainty quantification. So as a toyish motivating example, in this ambiguous object uh, detection case, it is the same one that I also mentioned before, it is unclear whether the person in the yellow box is a pedestrian or a cyclist. And so you might say, who cares? Well, you care because when you do trajectory forecasting, whether the person is a, a pedestrian or a cyclist, uh, might change the prediction of a future behavior. For example, how quickly this person could uh, uh, you know, traverse the road. Now, traditional ML methods would output uh, a single class uh, prediction and the uh, planning stack would greedily act with respect to this uh, single uh, output. Not really reasoning about the potential ambiguity that we have in this case. Now with uncertainty quantification, we would effectively output a set prediction that contains both potential classes, so basically cyclist and pedestrian. And then when we feed this information to a contingency planner, then the AV could, for example, execute an action that is safe 
with respect to both uh, possible uh, uh, classes. So according to my group, we have been investigating methods to provide uh, calibrated uncertainty estimates for machine learning models. In particular, in our research, we embrace the notion of uh, conformal prediction, which is a quite convenient statistical tool to produce calibrated uncertainties for any existing machine learning model. So the idea is as follows. So as I said, traditional machine learning models typically output a single prediction of a level and uh, typically with some heuristic notion of uh, uncertainty. The single level prediction can be arbitrarily far away from the ground truth and the heuristic uncertainty may not be calibrated. So what conformal prediction does, and by the way, conformal prediction was developed about 20 years ago, but it is starting to get, start to get traction in the statistical community, I would say about five years ago. Now it's a quite a hot topic in statistics. And I think it has a lot of potential in robotics as I'm trying to motivate now. So in particular, what conformal prediction does is to turn the single uh, prediction into a set prediction uh, y hat, which is probably guaranteed to cover the ground truth level Y, in the sense that the probability that the ground truth level Y belongs to the prediction set that we compute, uh, Y hat, is larger than one minus epsilon, where epsilon is a user provided uh, uh, threshold. So that's our definition of uh, calibration in a conformal prediction. So how, can we, how does it work? Well, the first step in a conformal prediction is to start with a definition of a non-conformity score function S of X, Y. So this is the function that we use in order to compute the prediction set. For a given input X, the prediction set contains all levels Y such that the function S of X, Y is less than a threshold Q. And we're going to discuss uh, briefly how to compute this threshold. Now the conformal prediction uh, procedure allow us to get a coverage guarantee for any choice of non-conformity score function. That said, we are interested in non-conformity score functions that give rise to small prediction sets in order for these prediction sets to be uh, useful for downstream applications. Of course, if I give you for as a prediction set, uh, the entire uh, space of the output, then of course I'm going to have a coverage guarantee, but it is completely useless uh, downstream. So in order to minimize the size of the set, we want to choose a score function such that for every input X, the ground truth level has a score that is significantly lower than the score for all the other uh, levels. This is exactly what we call this function as a non-conformity score function. Uh, ideally input output levels that are inconsistent should produce high non-conformity values. In practice, it's common to define such a non-conformity score function as of XY uh, in terms of comparing the level Y with uh, the output of the machine learning model, so F of X. So just to fix ideas, for example, let's assume that we have a classification task going back to the previous example. We can choose the S of XY as one minus the softmax uh, probability that the model F assigns to the level Y. So in this example, if cyclist is the ground truth, I highlighted in both phase, and the model is well-trained, then the softmax probability should be high, and then the score function should be, uh, the score should be, the non-conformity score should be low. The point is that the softmax output is not calibrated in general. With this procedure, actually we get uh, a notion of calibration. Now, the next step is to evaluate the chosen non-conformity score function over a set of leveled calibration data. We assume that this um, calibration data is statistically exchangeable with the test time data, which is typically trivially true if you have uh, IID uh, data, even though exchangeability is a little bit of a milder condition. And what this assumption does is to, ensure, is to ensure that the empirical distribution of your scores when evaluated on the calibration data uh, provides information about the distribution of the non-conformity score evaluated on the test data. So in this way, if you compute the quantile of uh, this distribution, we get guarantee that the chance that non-conformity score 
evaluated on the test data exceed this threshold is less than epsilon. This means that if we construct the prediction set to include all levels which yield a score that is less than the threshold, so the quantile, we can guarantee that this set will contain the true probability with a true level with probability at least one minus epsilon. So at first it might sound a little bit confusing, but it's very clever and in retrospect it's not too difficult. I recommend this interesting paper to get you know, a primer on a conformal prediction. So we are basically done. So test time, what we do is uh, when we observe a new test uh, input, we first compute the non-conformity score at the given input for all levels, and then construct our prediction set to contain all levels with conformity score below the threshold. And then we are mathematically guaranteed that the probability that the true level belongs to the prediction set at y is greater than one minus epsilon. The proof is basically four lines, is a super short. And the key concept is this concept of exchangeability. So basically we know that our uh, score function uh, because of exchangeability is going to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, now here with the high probability should be low the, the quantile. So if you just output all levels that are below the quantile, you have high probability the prediction set uh, contains the ground truth level. All right. So overall, conformal prediction is a simple post-training calibration procedure which adds minimal computational overhead, super quick to run. It is applicable to any machine learning model. Can and most importantly, can translate. Uh, heuristic notion of uh, uncertainty into theoretically principled recent, uh, representation of uncertainty in terms of uh, coverage guarantees. And importantly, these prediction sets are input dependent. With a good choice of the score function, the prediction sets are going to be tight for uh, some inputs while are going to grow larger for harder inputs. So let me give an example of how we apply this to uh, the problem of uh, um, key point detection. So the task is in key point detection is as follows. So given a 2D image and a CAD model of an object, the goal is to estimate the 3D rotation and the translation of the 3D model, for example, of a target vehicle. So the mainstream pipeline has uh, two stages. In the first stage, a neural network predicts the location of uh, key points for the object. And in the second stage, given the key points, we find the rotation and the translation, which best align the CAD models to the key points. Now, this approach clearly depends on the key points being estimated accurately. If they are far from the ground truth, the, uh, the estimate, the final estimate could be erroneous and also could be misleading. Conformal prediction allow us to address this channel by conformalizing the key point predictor with a careful notion of a non-conformity score function that I will discuss in a second, we obtain a predictor that rather than predicting single key points, produces set predictions in the, former, in the form of 2D balls, which are shown in yellow. Um, conformal prediction guarantees that the key points will belong to these uh, uh, yellow balls uh, formally with a probability larger than say 90%. Now, given these are set point predictions, we have developed a methodology to uh, propagate the uncertainty in the key points into uncertainty in the target uh, pose, all while, all while retaining the uh, uh, statistical guarantees on accuracy. For example, we can claim in this case that the target is 21 meters away and that the prediction is at most 1.2 meters off from the ground truth with probability larger than say 90%. So more, more in detail, our key insight is to design a conformity score, which leverages the information provided by the key point detection neural network, whose output is a heat map for the potential location of each of the key points in the image. Yellow region in the image um, highlights uh, uh, high probability that the key point is in there. Blue means a low probability. Concretely, let's say that the case key point of a car is the rear red light. The ground truth location of uh, this key point is uh, represented by the green circle in the top uh, left. 
And then let's note the ground truth position as YK, which we do not know, we're trying to estimate. So we refer to the most likely location of the key point according to the heat map as a, a WK with associated peak probability PK. Given this information, we design a non-conformity score function as follows. First, we compute a key point level non-conformity score, phi sub k, where phi sub k is simply multiplication between the peak probability and then the uh, distance between the peak location and the ground truth uh, key point location. Then we compute the object level score by basically taking a maximum over all these uh, distances. Intuitively, the non-conformity score is large when the neural network is uh, confidently ground about at least one of the key point reductions. We then perform the calibration step as explained before and we compute a quantile. The prediction set then contains all the key points positions such that, they conform, such that the non-conformity score is below Q, which is our quantile. So this implies that uh, our uncertainty sets for the key points are balls that are centered around the um, peak location WQ with a radius that is inversely proportional, inversely proportional to the peak probability uh, PK. Um, and then we do uncertainty propagation to the poles in order to get uh, 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 uncertainty sets about the poles. So let me show the application of this framework to an popular object uh, detection data set, which, cont which contains around 1,200 uh, images. Uh, we use conformal prediction with a threshold at 10%. Uh, uh, so we expect our predictions to be, uh, our, our prediction set to contain the ground truth level with probability at least as large as 90%. To estimate the pose of an object, as I mentioned before, what we do is to first, uh, detect the object uh, bounding box, and then we uh, predict, uh, conformalize the uh, uh, key point sets denoted by the circles. And then we propagate the uncertainty in the key points to so uncertainty in the poles. And from the poles uncertainty information, we obtain an average pose and also a worst case error bound. So in the first plot, we show the empirical coverage rate. So that is the fraction of the held out uh, test samples for which the ground truth pose lies in the prediction set that we compute. And as you can see, the coverage is around 90% for all objects with a little bit of fluctuation that are of course due to noise and not acceptable. In the second plot, we compare the worst case error bound that we computed on the X axis with against the true rotation error on the Y axis. Uh, over all test images for which our prediction set contain the ground truth. And so we make two main uh, observations. The first one is that the blue dots never cross the diagonal, which means that basically our worst case error bound is a valid error bound, which is of course important so that we can trust this error bound for control applications. Second, we see that uh, our error bounds are fairly close to the true errors in the sense that the many points are quite close to the Diagonal. So we make uh, uh, you know, safe predictions, but at the same time, they are not in general over conservative. All right, so the key takeaway message is that applying conformal prediction to AI models can allow AI components to communicate uncertainty in their predictions in a manner that is uh, calibrated. Again, the message here is that the game your machine learning model of choice with some heuristic notion of uncertainty through this calibration procedure. I can turn that heuristic notion of uncertainty into something that has some provable guarantee. You may ask how many calibration points will you need? Typically not that many. In our applications, typically we consider 500 more or less calibration points. And actually there are some theoretical results that allow you to bound how many calibration points uh, uh, you would need. Uh, so we're excited to apply, I mean, these are still fairly preliminary results. We have a paper that is going to come up at CDPR. Uh, but in general, we are excited about extending these techniques to an uh, increasingly large uh, set of models in the AV stack. That, for example, now we're looking at the occupancy network, conformalizing occupancy networks. One question that's a uh, uh, natural question to wonder is, uh, can we control somehow the size of the um, prediction set. And so in this 
respect we're uh, considering uh, the setting whereby we consider a parameterized uh, non-conformity score function. And then we optimize the non-conformity score, uh, score function in order to minimize the size, the size of the prediction set subject to the constraints that your coverage guarantee has to be larger than uh, some value that you decide. decide. And then we're looking at more complicated settings whereby we can provide guarantees for a temporally, for example, correlated uh, data. So I think there are a lot of opportunities here and uh, that I'm, you know, we're, quite we're quite excited to explore. All right, so let's move on to the last topic, which is the topic of auto distribution uh, detection runtime monitoring. So in particular, um, at design time, we can only uh, uh, calibrate our models for edge cases that are present in the training data. Of course, we don't have access to test time data, which is useful. And I show you one methodology conform position that does that. But on the other hand, when you deploy your autonomous system by definition, you might face with unknown unknowns. And so there is a question of how you detect those in real time. So this is the problem of anomaly detection runtime monitoring. A little bit more specifically, what time is it? Okay. So um, a little bit more specifically, the setting is as follows. So say that we have an autonomous aircraft that uh, is tasked with uh, tracking the center line of a runway and assume that you have a perception deep neural network that translates uh, images into an estimate of a lateral displacement error. And then this estimate is used for closed loop control, for example, to adjust the steering angle of the front wheel. Now let's further assume that this deep neural network is trained on clear morning lighting conditions. When the environment changes, for example, we are operating at night, the observation might be quite different from those seen at uh, training time. So we are, we are actually might be facing auto distribution observations. So this difference can lead into faults in perception, for example, a wrong estimate for your lateral displacement and in, uh, in the end, uh, uh, negative impact the closed loop performance of the system. So to enable safe deployment of the systems, it's important that we can detect these anomalous conditions. And in this context, then the question is, how do we equip any pre-trained deep neural network model with monitors that can provide an anomalous signal warning us about the possible presence of an outer domain or outer distribution event? So, to answer this question, first of all, one has to define what we mean by auto distribution. Uh, at the high level, we understand what that means, but then uh, once you try to be a little bit more quantitative, this is a relatively nebulous notion. Perhaps the most intuitive way to measure auto distribution is in terms of distances in the input space. An input such as uh, this one aligned in the back is uh, seen as auto distribution if it is far enough from the data seen at the training time. Now, this is intuitive appealing is probably the first definition that might come up to your mind, but it's not very actionable. It's difficult to implement. For one, uh, basically it requires you to define a notion of a distance that is uh, tractable and meaningful, but it's typically hard to do in hard to define manifolds such the space of real world images. And then second of all, in order to carry out these distances, you will need to store all the data into your machine. And of course, this is not really a solution that the scale and it is feasible you know, from a memory storage standpoint. So there is an alternative and there's learning a parametric model of the training distribution by basically leveraging uh, advances in alternative modeling. So after modeling this distribution, we can evaluate the test time inputs uh, in terms of uh, how likely they are, they are with respect to this uh, uh, learned distribution. However, this approach is best suited to reason about the IAD type of samples. But unfortunately, in robotics applications, we're more interested in settings whereby either we want to test whether the sample I have, so just one single sample is in or out of distribution, and this model is not uh, very good at it, or we have a correlated samples, because of course, there is correlation across frames, and this model, you know, this approach really doesn't allow you to reason about that. But most importantly, the drawback of this approach and also the previous approach is that these definitions are really disconnected from the prediction task at hand. We only reason about inputs 
and not how changes in inputs might lead to changes in the model's predictions, which is ultimately what we care about because we're interested in closed loop control. So in our work to address these shortcomings, we address, we, def we define a notion of auto distribution from the perspective of uh, functional uncertainty. Specifically, we argue that an input is a auto domain or auto distribution for a given prediction task if the prediction for that input is not well determined by the uh, training data. For example, an example on the right is a toy example whereby I have a, a, a function mapping one scalar into another scalar. I have uh, different models that uh, I use to fit my data. The training data is uh, highlighted by gray circles. For these points here, I have a lot of disagreements in the model. So this uh, uh, here the, the, the prediction is not very well from training data. So here I say these points, according to this definition, are out of distribution. Here there is a lot of agreements between the among different models. So I deem that point as uh, in distribution. So how do we evaluate this notion of functional uncertainty? For that, we turn to Bayesian methods, which basically require three main steps. First, again, for the example, you know, toy example of uh, whereby we have a function mapping one scalar into on the x-axis into another scalar on the y-axis. First, we need to define a prior of our functions, mapping inputs to outputs. And here I'm showing some possible priors. Next, given training data, we need to compute the posterior distribution of our functions that are consistent with the training data. Again, highlighted by the gray dots. And we do so by leveraging Bayes rule. And finally, given this posterior of our functions, we can measure the remaining uncertainty over the output and new test uh, inputs to classify inputs as in or out of distribution. So translated to our context, this recipe entails first, identifying a, a prior distribution over the space of functions mapping from the potentially high dimensional input space of, deep, of a deep neural network into the output. Second, devising methods to efficiently compute a posterior over such a function class. And then third, finding a way to uh, compute the predictive uncertainty with low latency, which can then be used as, a nominal sig as an anomaly signal and then it can be thresholded in order to differentiate inputs as in or out of distribution. So our approach is called a SCOD and was developed uh, in collaboration with uh, Navid here. And uh, basically it applies this uh, Bayesian methodology. And the key technical insights here is to basically use techniques from matrix sketching in order to represent the covariance with respect to the posterior function class in terms of low rank factors. So this is the basically main technical insight. Uh, insight. I won't go into the details here, but uh, we show that uh, this is a very effective approach. It takes, it's very computationally efficient. It takes a few minutes seconds to compute and it outperforms most of the baselines out there. For example, those that leverage a deep ensemble. Here I show uh, an example of applying Scott, just to give you an idea about what you can do with this type of techniques. Going back to the, around, you know, the taxing example, with an aircraft. Uh, so what I'm going to show on the left hand side is the image that is taken by a camera mounted on the wing of the aircraft. And remember this image is then translated into an estimate of lateral displacement. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to show a plot where X is time and Y is the magnitude of the anomaly signal. And I'm going to mark every time that the network makes a mistake with a black X. Mistake means that the lateral displacement error is larger than one meter. So we assume that the network has been trained in a clear morning lighting conditions. And we see that in this case, the network is not really making mistakes. We are not, we don't have a, a black axis. And accordingly, the anomaly signal stays relatively uh, small. When we turn to afternoon conditions, which were not part of the training data set, we start seeing the shadows that basically uh, confuse the network. And we see the network starts making mistakes. You see all the black crosses means that we're making a mistake in lateral displacement error. But the anomaly signal is significantly higher. And so we can disambiguate this case and we say, well, uh, this is an anomalous case. So at, at the minimum, we should be aware that the output of the neural network is not trustworthy. So probably you should enact a contingency plan, okay, which is exactly what we're doing Currently, is to basically finding ways to use such a monitor 
in order to uh, inform downstream decision making. The easier way to do it is basically to switch between a neural network dependent controller and a trusted recovery policy every time we detect uh, an anomaly according to the SCOD signal. Interestingly, to uh, set the threshold, we use again techniques from conformal prediction that allow us to derive uh, system level uh, guarantees. Now, I'll skip this since uh, we are almost uh, at time and I will just conclude with a parting thought. So is this sufficient? So I argue that this methodology seems to work quite well. It's computational efficient, minimal computational overhead. It outperforms pretty much everything out there, for example, deep ensembles and so on and so forth. But still, is it sufficient? And unfortunately, frustratingly, the answer is no. So for example, here I'm showing a video from a Tesla uh, vehicle. So here at first, the video doesn't make sense. You have a traffic light that's spawned by a truck, but in reality, what you have is a truck with traffic lights on top. And, uh, and you as a human understand exactly what it means, but the poor Tesla is completely confused. So here's another example where now is a stop sign giving trouble. I mean, these are real world cases. Uh, whereby there is a stop sign that is uh, uh, part of a billboard. So there was an ad with a stop sign for whatever reason in it. And this actually causes continu continuously ghost breaks on uh, automated vehicles because the stop signs were interpreted as a true stop sign. So what is interesting here is that uh, at the object level, you can't really say that the detector is uh, malfunctioning. Uh, so we call this class of problems semantic anomalies which are basically uh, unseen cases in the training data set that are due to the unusual combination of in-distribution objects. So these semantic anomalies create a system level failures, like for example, uh, ghost breaks. And while it may be difficult for us as designers to anticipate all these possible semantic anomalies, on the other hand, a little bit of contextual information is all that the system needs in order to reason what's going wrong here. So to uh, reason about this contextual information, we turn to the emerging capabilities of foundation models, specifically large language models. Here we have recreated the previous example in Carla. And we can see that the autonomous vehicle is mis misled by the traffic light on top of the truck and it stops in the middle of the road. So the question is, can we anticipate this before it happens? So um, we have explored the idea of using an uh, uh, open vocabulary object detector to parse a scene and then use the output of uh, this object detector as an input for a large language model. For example, here we see that object detector detects that there is a truck, a tree, and importantly, a truck carrying a traffic light. So we use this information within uh, an input prompt uh, template that you can see is uh, quite uh, long. Here we incorporate various best practices in order to warm start the uh, LLM, similar to chain of thought type of example. So if you were an object detector and you and we, and we provide a few examples of how the LLM should reason about semantic anomalies. So we give that to our LLM. And that's what we get as an output. Where uh, we see that uh, for some objects that are benign, so basically they should not impact the, this, the reasoning capabilities of the uh, robot, the LLM doesn't, doesn't trigger an anomaly. But for our, for the case of the traffic light, it understands that it's an anomaly, and it also provides an explanation about why this could be an anomaly to them, which is kind of interesting. So the equation that we ask is can a vehicle drive safely in the presence of uh, in this uh, traffic light in the truck? No, you should see the vehicle is interpreting the traffic light as a legal traffic uh, signal. So not only we know that there's an anomaly, but we also have an explanation about why that is an anomaly. Now, we have used this methodology successfully in a robotic manipulation context, as well as in other driving scenarios. But of course, this is just a start. Uh, so, first of all, it's notable that the LLMs can um, recognize the root causes of uh, some uh, semantic uh, errors, but we have noticed that sometimes they can also hallucinate sources of uh, confusion. 
So hallucination is actually a well-known problem of LLMs. So we're working on ways to better ground and constrain the LLM outputs in the capability of the language model in order to avoid such hallucinations. On the other hand, not all hallucinations are bad. Indeed, both researchers and practitioners are using such uh, hallucinations for data augmentation. Basically, you can view these uh, hallucinations as extrapolation of your training data set that can be used in order to augment your uh, training data set. Uh, in the example that I provided, I show how to use uh, basically a, uh, a detector in order to parse the scene into a text representation that can be fed into an LLM. This is clunky, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we, so we soon have vision foundation models where basically you can give the latter as an input and an image. And of course, an image uh, is worth 1,000 or 10,000 tokens, uh, if not more. So often in the future, we'll be able to ask basically a semantic anomaly related equation directly in the visual space. And finally, I see semantic anomaly detectors as I explained here as a complementary tool with respect to the runtime monitors that I explained uh, before. The runtime monitors that I explained before uh, are more geared toward non-semantic anomalies. And then here we have a technology to detect semantic anomalies. So it's interesting uh, you know, area for future research is how do we integrate these different levels of reasoning about uh, auto-distribution events. So summing up, runtime monitors, useful, very useful to deploy AI-based uh, AB stacks. In particular, we're looking at uh, large language models as a way to reason about the uh, semantic anomalies. A lot of interesting challenges here, like for example, uh, providing more theoretical guarantees about the performance of uh, monitors in terms of po false positive rates, false negative rates, uh, techniques to identify anomalies in task-driven fashion. So we want to flag something as anomalous only if it's really going to uh, jeopardize a decision-making downstream. Uh, we are using uh, 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 you know, these techniques from the point of view of data lifecycle management. So if you detect an anomaly on the car, then this actually becomes a valuable uh, data point that can be used for model training, which is a huge uh, problem and big deal, especially for automotive companies. And of course, we're working on LLMs for detecting semantic anomalies. If you're interested in this topic, we have an overview paper we published recently, where basically we provide a broad categorization of all the problems in robotics and discuss uh, open research questions. And with that, I'll conclude. Uh, takeaways, generally AI, very useful for uh, closed loop simulation with uh, uh, where we want to emulate the behavior of humans. Conformal prediction seems to be a very powerful tool to provide a calibrated uncertainty estimates for machine learning models. And LLM seems to be a very prominent tool to reason about a very difficult semantic level type of anomalies. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for your, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. So for the first one, uh, it's about uh, generative AI for simulation. So uh, you have a work when uh, using the large language model to translate the natural language to STL rules and generate the testing scenarios. I'm wondering how do you handle the ambu ambiguity from the natural language? Because say uh, the policeman wants a scenario that the car crashes on the left, but this, there could be many ambiguity in this, right? Because the car could be uh, at anywhere on the left, how do you on the left and how long the car, uh, when the cars crash. So how do we uh, handle those details in this kind of translation? Yeah, I mean, that is really work in progress. I would say that that ambiguity is not necessarily something negative because it can allow you to reason about uh, multiple different variations of, uh, I mean, the police reports are, are ambiguous. That's right. And there, yes. is not, there is no ground truth. So that's, uh, first of all, the thing. So yes, they are open to ambiguity. So basically the language model specification will give rise to one potential instance that is bounded by uh, what was written in the police report. Is that truly representative of what happened in reality? We don't know because we don't have the ground truth. But on the other hand, that ambiguity, as I said, could be potentially useful because it allows you to give rise to difficult, different variations of, a, of an accident that has happened. 
Cool. And then for the, uh, the second question is about the conformal prediction. Mm -hmm. So we've seen the conformal prediction can be very helpful uh, coping with the AI components to give trustworthy applications. So I wonder, uh, is it possible to incorporate conformal prediction with lar large language models? And yes, yeah. So one of the things we're working on that uh, I haven't uh, um, discussed today is that language models actually also come with uh, probabilities associated with the outputs that in my experience, I don't know about your experience, uh, are garbage, essentially. And uh, apparently with GPT-4, we're going to have uh, better probabilities. But as I mean, we were discussing with Emilio Frasoli yesterday, the fact that you have a number between zero and one doesn't mean that you have a, a probability that you can act upon. So there is still an interest in basically doing a calibration for the probabilities that come out of large language models. So for that, actually, we're also using, looking at uh, um, conformal prediction techniques. Uh, that said, conformal prediction is a very powerful and general uh, uh, tool, but with all general tools, it also comes with its deficiencies. The main deficiency is uh, this, the size of the prediction set. If you really compute a good score function, then you have a prediction set that typically is very small and very actionable. But I think that, especially for the type of applications we are interested in as robotics, a lot of more work should be made on finding ways to optimize the score functions with a specific goal of minimizing the uh, uncertainty, the prediction set. Okay, thank yeah. you. But we haven't done any work yet. Um, so we plan to do work on applying conformal prediction to the outputs and online model, but we haven't done anything yet, or almost anything. Any more questions? Big picture, what's your take on the state of autonomous driving research today? <laughs> that the competition is increasingly fierce. In the sense that, uh, well, in the United States, we know about, of course, Waymo, we know about Cruise, we know about Zooks, we know about Tesla, we know about Mobileye, we know about NVIDIA. But in the past year, year and a half, the progress in the China market has been uh, tremendous. And uh, actually, and it's not just one company, it's like 10 companies that are, they have very innovative ideas in terms of how they are architecting their stack, some of them uh, mapless, uh, extremely efficient, um, which is good for the ecosystem, but the ecosystem is certainly changing. I think another aspect that is changing a little bit is that uh, uh, companies working, and you know, this could be a little bit controversial, but I think that companies working on very advanced driver assistance systems, I think they might have a little bit of an edge in uh, the next few years, because of course the problem is increasingly becoming a data problem, and of course, with Waymo or Cruise, you can have a few thousands of vehicles on the road, which is great. But uh, with advanced driver assistance systems, basically you have uh, systems, you know, millions of vehicles that are gathering data for, for you. And that could be potentially, I mean, the jury is still out there, but a uh, pot key potential advantage. But I haven't answered your question yet. So to answer your question more specifically, we do have robot taxi systems in uh, San Francisco, for example. I was two days ago in San Francisco and there was plenty of Waymo vehicles going left and right, which is very nice to see. But the thing that at the, at the product profit generating level is still all about Alta Plus. Uh, and starting 2024, 2025, I think it will become massive. I mean, now we have sort of Tesla, but in a couple of years, will be much richer uh, ecosystem. So I think that there has been, of course, um, I mean, the peak of the hype, and of course, there's the winter. I like to say that now we're a little bit on back on the way up in a different form, like for in terms of really making a profit, L2 plus seem to be uh, now the way to go. But also technologically, I would argue that uh, the way we architect the stack is very different from just a few years ago. Like for example, and, and I'll conclude, uh, for me, it's been amazing to see how some technologies like transformers that uh, five years ago were you know, just a paper are being productized. So the pace of tech transfer is really, really mind blowing. Great. Um, just, is there still a place for uh, students at a place like MIT or Stanford working? In a kind of a <laughs> normal I hope so, yes, yeah, of course. Great. I mean, uh, so there are, I mean, 
I can talk at length about it. So there are some questions that I think are better carried out in the, these large organizations. But then there are some, you know, many other questions, like for example, related to how we reason about uh, uh, safety or completely different architecture. They're still very much open. Scalability, I mean, how we make these models adaptable to new regions of the world with uh, little data. I think that is far from understood and not, it's not something that you just solve by throwing data at it. It requires you know, clever algorithm design. And that's where I think there is a lot of space for university as well. Using LLMs, uh, I think, you know, foundation model in general, in order to have a quick prototypes, you don't need uh, uh, GTP, GPT-4 maximum scale. You can still do it with relatively small, at least to have a prototype. So yeah, there was a paper recently that someone uh, sent to me about uh, frustration of AI research in the age of uh, open AI. There were like 15 different strategies. I don't know if you saw the paper. There were 15 different strategies ranging from give up with your research or focus on application that nobody cares about today. Or... So, but the point being is that, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one last question before we're done. Thanks for the great answer. The one last question. Hi, yep. Hi thanks for the talk. Um, just have a question regarding conformal prediction part. Mm -hmm. uh, one of, even though it's a very powerful tool, I, if I'm not mistaken, it assumes that the inputs are prior, are RIDs of the output. Technically exchangeable. So exchangeable basically means that uh, your training data and your test time data uh, have a distribution that is invariant under permutation. This is trivially true in the case of IID data, but the data does not need to be necessarily IID for this exchangeability assumption to work. Uh, but one of my questions is that, or one of the main challenges of using conformal prediction on control tasks, which the most common usage of using conformal prediction would be like putting it on like a model like Project on++, for example, uh, is that the inputs or like the, or like any motion from like an ego vehicle might actually out, out affect the, tra the trajectory from like the, from the prediction. Uh, so I was wondering if you can still use conformal prediction in these cases. And well, not uh, yeah. So extensibility is uh, a, a, you know a critical assumption. So uh, one of the difficulties applying in in general conformal prediction to robotics is many times you have correlated data for which the extensibility assumption does not work. So conformal conformal prediction does not work. So you had to pay special attention on a how the data is generated. For example, for the data set for the key, po uh, key point post estimation problem. It turns out that, that the, da the data set is built in a way that the accentuated assumption works. Or for the point of view of control application, you had to frame your question in a way that uh, it satisfies the accentuability uh, assumption. Like for example, I don't know, if uh, uh, we did something related to the trajectory forecasting in the context of uh, warning systems, so basically deciding whether the, um, uh, the output of uh, uh, um, basically your trajectory forecasting methods is not trustworthy. And we were able to recast the problem in a way that the extensibility assumption works. And we can discuss a little bit more the details offline. But particularly for trajectory of risk, actually it's not trivial. And you cannot just plan and apply it. And there is some work, for example, from Immanuel Kandesh, who is a no, mathematician at Stanford about extending conformal prediction to uh, correlated uh, input sequences, but still a little bit in its infancy. As I said, this topic has really become a hot topic in statistics in the past two, three years. So now most of the theory is being built and extended to also tackle uh, more and more problems in robotics. Thanks. Thank you so much.